throw it out I had to scream and shout Before I turn to dust I've got to throw it out Before I turn to dust Hello, this is Michael Small, host of the podcast I Couldn't Throw It Out, bringing you a flashback to November 20th, 1996. You're about to hear one of the very first live streaming interviews on the internet. It's my one-hour conversation with John Flansburg, co-founder of the rock band They Might Be Giants. We were broadcast live on the Hotwired website, which, by the way, no longer exists on the internet. So it's just lucky that I saved the complete, unedited interview from nearly 30 years ago. If you want to hear something a little more timely, you'll find my brand new interview with John Flansburg on the podcast, I Couldn't Throw It Out, wherever you get podcasts except Spotify or at throwitoutpodcast.com. Here we go, back to 1996. Thanks for logging on to Pop Talk. It's Hotwired's forum for live interactive audio programs. While you're listening to live broadcasts and real audio, you can join the rest of the audience in talk.com for a simulcast chat session. That's where you can participate in today's show. Just follow the links that say chat here now. And here's our host, pop editor, Michael Small. Thanks, Lenny. I'm here with John Flansberg, who is one of the two main members of the group They Might Be Giants. The lower half of They Might Be Giants, I like to think of myself. And he's in town in San Francisco for a show at the Warfield tonight and to play a lot of songs from the band's sixth full-length album, Factory Showroom, which is perhaps the greatest album by They Might Be Giants and anyone in the history of the world. Wow. Interesting perspective. I try to... But I agree. Yes. I try not to be biased when I <laughs> do an interview. Also, I would like to add right from the start that, that um, John also worked on a solo project called Mono Puff, mm-hmm. uh, which was a record that came out... It came out this last summer on Disc, And... As I told him earlier, that record is totally rockin', as you will discover you. when you listen to the song Totally Rockin', which is one of the greatest songs in the history of the world, I believe. All right. Um, now, I don't understand why you didn't get along with Yoko Ono. When you, if you start off an interview like this, you... I don't know. that Yoko Ono, she's, she's a tough interview, uh-huh. but we can get beyond those things. Okay. And meanwhile, why did you kill your mother? Uh, well, she was bugging me. Okay, good answer. Um... I think I'd like to start by asking you about the song I Can Hear You on the Uh record. Would you be willing to tell the folks at home how this song was recorded, why it was recorded that way, and how it all came about? Sure. Well, actually, a few years ago, it's it's kind of a a convoluted tale, uh, and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Basically, a friend of ours, Nick Hill, who works at a radio station called WFMU in in West Orange, New Jersey, um, uh, invited us to contribute a song to this FMU benefit record that was about Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison's laboratory is in West Orange. And so there are a lot of things that sort of celebrate Edison in that town. And there's also, on this truly alternative radio station, WFMU, they have a, a wax cylinder and 78, sort of a pre-electrical recording show where they play all these old records from the 20s and the, and the whatever you call the O's. The aughts? The aughts. The aughts, and then you know the 1890s, and um, the people who put that show together have a demonstration at the Edison Museum every year, where they have they bring in some live music performers, and they actually cut some wax cylinders. And uh, there's this guy named Peter Dill, which is an engineer who basically maintains this crazy, interesting, archaic equipment. He makes his own wax cylinders, and um, this stuff is, is basically the wax cylinder recorder. is It's a different format. It's just like a record player in that it's got a groove and a needle and all that stuff, and it spins around. Um, uh, but uh, what's different about wax cylinder recorders than modern uh, records is that they're not they don't use electricity to to work. They're basically just these contraptions that work with sound pressure, and you sing into these to make the the wax cylinder recording. You sing into these giant cones that look like the things that are on your dog's head when you get take them to the vet, you know, those things. And one of them is like 12 feet long, and one of them is just kind of like, you know, dog-sized. And uh, I sang the song, and basically it was like bellowing into this thing, and, and the band was playing into this other 12-foot long one. And uh, it was just a really interesting experience, you know. Was in, and to make the recording and to, and to have the, uh, 
you know, to be in that place and then put the wax cylinder onto the player and hear it back. It really was like being, you know, I, I really felt like I was experiencing time travel because there are all these aspects to the way it sounds that really are very specific to that technology. I mean, you actually have to change your performance style to make, to make it work because you have to sing very, very loudly, which so there's this strident thing going on that, you know, it's not too different than the sound of real audio coming over your computer, but when you hear those 78s and the guy's going like, I love you, it's not simply because that was the style of singing that was popular at the time. It was also that they had to sing very loud to be heard. And that was the big revelation of the whole experience was that there was this technological part of, of making those recordings back then. So we were, you know, we were just like sort of flattered to be invited. And, and like, I guess like Wynton Marsalis had done it the year before and Les Paul had done it the, the year before that. Les Paul wouldn't play an acoustic guitar, which I thought was kind of, Cool. He stuck by his uh, electric. You know, he's like he's wor he's like making a recording on this wax cylinder, and he still still had to play electric. I keep thinking that when after Armageddon, when there's no more electricity, mm -hmm. the only music that will survive is like this song. People uh -huh. can listen to this over and over and over again. Well, the song itself is is you know it was it was a site specific song. It was written for the performance, and and um, I mean as you know, for people who aren't familiar with the song, basically it, it's kind of uh, all the different things that you hear coming out of speakers. And, and the wax cylinder was the original mechanical sound reproduction device. I mean, it wasn't just the big first record player. It was also the first speaker. So that's what kind of set my imagination going, thinking about how it's affected our lives and how many things have little crummy speakers making noise at us. Every, I mean, especially living in New York. I mean, I guess it's probably true everywhere now, but... Um, you know, just between like phone machines and intercoms and computers and computers and and like car alarm. There are all these car alarms in my neighborhood that like talk at you now that are just kind of strange and distracting. So uh, that that was what the song is about. I, I, another song I wanted to talk about is Spiraling Shape. I mm -hmm. find the song really interesting. I, for people who haven't heard it yet, I guess it's about the latest trend and the need for a new trend every other minute or something like that. Well, it was originally it was written um, to be in this movie uh, for the kids in the hall, the kids in the hall movie, which is I, which, I don't know what it was finally entitled. I think it was uh, original title was the drug, so it's kind of it's kind of a got a drug aspect to it, and about these psychedelic experiences. It, but isn't it also about how trends come and go, which is what I read in the line? Oh, right, the right. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, that would be a much better question for my partner, John Linnell, who really is who's the author of the song. Um, so I don't want to, like, put words in his mouth. But, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to completely grasp what the song is about. Well, your career has extended over so many years, and you've seen so many trends come and mm -hmm. go that I wanted to ask you about a few of the recent trends mm -hmm. that this song might uh, refer to. For instance, have you kept up with cocktail music, and do you have any opinion about the whole lounge scene well it's interesting because friends of mine were really a big part of bar none our in, original indie label back in the 80s uh out of hoboken new jersey uh put out the first esquivel record which i i seems like i mean the first esquivel reissue which I, I guess is kind of like the beginning of uh i mean that was the big original lounge music uh reissue um I don't know. It's you know. I think I think the American culture has 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 got has figured out camp at this point, which is kind of interesting. Like it's it's strange to me to see you know mall culture become campy, you know, as opposed to kitschy, you know. So I have trouble thinking of any truly sincere and deeply heartfelt music. That's cool. It seems like in the '60s, this very heartfelt music was cool. In fact, there's even a reference in one of your songs to like the freak letting my freak fly. Uh huh. Right. Right. Fly. Um, do you get the same feeling that uh, sincerity is not particularly popular at the moment, or do you think that's well? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, for me, I feel like sincerity is something that you can't just declare. I mean, if you, uh, you know, I don't, I don't. I feel like it's it's kind of an unsophisticated point of view to just say, but I'm being sincere. You know, that doesn't necessarily. I mean, 
most things are essentially sincere. I mean, most people are essentially sincere, but they are not really necessarily operating. I mean, it's, it's more complicated. I mean, the world is more complicated than just simply being sincere. I mean, it doesn't mean much to be sincere. How, how might that apply to your music? You know, one of the things I read about They Might Be Giants that annoys me mm -hmm. is that people write, oh, they're too clever for their own good. And I always right. think, well, what is too clever? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of people are looking for music to take them away from their day-to-day -day concerns. And so obviously, if something is very streamlined and simplified, that's a very easy vehicle that, they, that people can jump on and, be, and find themselves going to whatever place that that music, you know, whether it's like, and th I mean, that's, that's the function of like, whether it's like, you know, like rootsy, you know, R&B, like sex music, or if it's like, you know, new age music. I mean, in a certain way, people experience music, the way people, it seems like a lot of audiences want to experience music is this kind of escapist kind of thing. And I think, you know, what probably bugs a lot of people about our music is that it is, it's this very complicated thing that draws on you know, that draws on a lot of different, um, there are a lot of, there's this kind of, uh, well, it's hard to describe exactly, but a lot of times by the time we get to the third verse, we'll actually draw something in that will make it almost impossible to stay within the song. You know, <laughs> I mean, we almost can, we almost kind of destroy the mood of a song in this purposeful way. Um, and it's not, it's not, you know, it's not an act of, uh, we're not trying to be contrarians or we're not trying to like ruin the vibe, but I think it's just, there's something about what we're doing that we're, we really want to experiment with the form of popular music. I mean, I think everyone's very familiar with music that just sets a mood and sticks to it. Um, so, you know, to, people say like, you know, we're irritating. I mean, it, it's, you know, I mean, I think, you know, that's probably true, you know. I, I, you know, we probably do irritate a lot of people, but you know, for me personally, I find a lot of people really boring. So, you know, I mean, maybe you, you mean know, a maybe, lot of music. Maybe really it's boring. an even trade. Uh, yeah, well, a lot or, of music, a lot of music, and a lot of audiences. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I can't believe that. You know, I mean, I can't believe what people choose to listen to in in their spare time. Are you, know? you are you willing to? Go ahead and spell out a few of the things that you're not particularly crazy about. Oh, you know, and you know, virtually any anything. I mean, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. You know, I go into the record store. I'm like looking around, going like, man, I hate all that. You know, it's like, what, where's the good stuff? Yeah. You know, I mean, that people are all, you know, always kind of down on. I mean, it's interesting for me because I don't hold it against music. You know, unlike when I go into, you know, the video store, I'll go. I, I don't really like movies. You know, I don't like the movies. It's very hard yeah. for me to find a movie that I'm interested in. Right. Whereas, like, other people I know, they just are, they're just movie fans. Like, they're happy to consume movies, even though they just might even feel like they're kind of worthless. You said that you do some unconventional things with the music, but it's interesting because <laughs> you actually um, use very conventional pop music also, and you sort of mix experimental with pop music right I well i think i think like you know i don't think that our music is experimental in the sense that you know like john cage is experimental i don't i wouldn't want to like I, I i mean i really i do know the difference i mean we're working in this pop form and it's a very uh strangely orthodox kind of uh world that that we're we're working in but um but I think that there is this sort of open invitation in pop music to bring in elements that will make it completely different. And you don't have to do you don't have to do too much to break the form um, and still be you know kind of on you know on doing something that's that's quite different than your average top forty music. Well, we have a lot of questions oh, coming okay. in from uh, people who are listening and chatting. And uh, you can Let's actually see. select a question off I'll of there and off. go ahead and answer it. Uh, is that all the way from the top? Uh, How do they yeah. get off with minimal drums? I noticed on women and men there are no drums, just cymbal. That, that's, yes. that's not a question, but, is it? Well, <laughs> I guess. Well, so it's an, about the music. You don't have to answer every single question. <laughs> no, 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 or no, no. Repeat. Okay. You can actually pick and choose okay. things well, that you I'll want pick and to choose. talk about. And you um, should and and go ahead and give the name of the person who's asking because okay, that person likes uh, a little recognition. Uh, Rosie ninety eight. Do you think that your music has changed dramatically 
from the Flood album of 1991. Um, well, the way we put our song together in terms of the writing has not really changed at all. I mean, basically, we, we kind of, uh, you know, work on different strategies to come up with songs. Um, the end result is a little bit different because we have a full band. And in a lot of ways, um, I think it's more full-blown sound. It's sort of sonically more full-blown, and the music comes out more, which is a, a big plus for us because for a long time, people really thought of us as strictly this lyric-driven thing, that, like we had interesting lyrics and that the songs were just kind of this background stuff. And one thing that's nice about having... A, a good band backing us up and also um, just, I mean, well, it really have been working with really exceptional players. Um, we have a chance to really put the music, you know, right up there with the words and it's, it's, it's impossible to separate the two. And that's, that's how we really like it. We like it to be kind of a package. Do you miss the old days when it was just the two of you? It was really easy to just show up and set up your keyboard and that was it? Um, well, I mean, it's it's easy to get nostalgic. Um, it certainly was different. Uh, I realize now. I sort of feel, I realize now, as you know, in in the fullness of time, how odd it must have seemed to a lot of people. I mean, we played we played in a lot of theaters as a duo, and I'm surprised that we felt so. Uh, it seems really brave to me now that the two of us could feel like confident about just like facing an audience of two thousand people, two people on a stage. Um, but I was young and brave. Um, now, now I'm older and, and more frightened. One, one other variant on that question, which is not only how has your music changed, but if you can think back to what you really wanted in like the mid eighties mm -hmm. when you were starting and what you really want now, is there a difference? Like what you want out of your career, out of your life? Um, well, it, I mean, what I really wanted was a career. <laughs> I mean, that, I think, you know, that's, you know, I think that we, I just wanted to have a chance to play music, you know, so, I mean, it wasn't that complicated. I mean, in a way, we kind of have to reinvent our goals now a little bit, even, you know, simply because we've accomplished a lot of the things that we wanted to do. We were a local band in New York for like four years before we made a record. And, you know, once you've been in a band for a while and you haven't made a record, it's very easy to think like, well, maybe we never will make a record. A lot of, I mean, a lot of the recordings that we did um, at the beginning of our career were really not so much to make demos, but to like kind of get some personal satisfaction out of all the effort we were putting into what we were doing. Um, because it was really unclear whether or not anybody was going to, you know, find us or support what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you work with one person for that many years, I guess, is it like a, a marriage where you end up making rules that you stick with over the years, the rules keep changing? Well, our collaboration, we're lucky in that our collaboration is not set in the same way that a lot of other musical collaborations are set. It's not like um, one of us is the lyricist or one of us you know, writes the music or um, uh, our roles are pretty wide open. And um, because of that, I think we both end up getting a lot out of it. If, we want it, if we're interested in pursuing some part of it, um, the other one is, is certainly open to that. Um, so it's not as restricted as a lot of other, um, collaborative relationships are. And because we were kids together, it's a, it's probably a little, uh, you know, the, our general impulses are a little more unified. I mean, we actually do get along on a personal level, but also probably more importantly, we get along on a, on an artistic level. I mean, a lot of people like each other, but their ultimate artistic goals are really different. And for John and I, there's this, you know, I think, you know, when we started, we had this very clear person, like our agenda was very specific. I mean, we really want to do music that was completely like fat free, like no solos, no, no extra stuff, you know, nothing repeats, just like the, this really stripped down, very minimal kind of approach to songwriting. And you know we've loosened we we have loosened up over now, the years. Now it's more fat, more fat. Yeah, we we definitely um you know we enjoy like uh, songs having a little more room to breathe and and we we've also become a little bit more confident about what we're doing. I mean, it's not that um, well it's interesting because our our insecure our insecurities and our agenda were completely aligned at the beginning. You know, I think we were really afraid of boring people, and um, you know we wanted to make also make this really pushy thing. 
and um, over the years, we have become a little bit more confident, and that definitely allow you know gives us some more leeway. So let's go to another question from somebody. Okay, listening. will TMG come to Toronto soon? I do not know. Um, can I just? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm moving yeah, a little computer here. Um, somebody OB. Have you ever seen Return to Oz? Don't even know what that is. What do you think is your strongest album? Um, well, I think for me, our first album is our strongest album just because it's really, uh, it has this, even though it's got this really kind of kaleidoscopic aspect to it and there's a lot of rhythms and different musical styles incorporated, it's really of a piece and almost it's, it's every song kind of... Um, has its own special thing about it and it's everything is set really nicely and and ever since then i mean especially with like lincoln and flood i feel like there's even though there's like a big range of musical styles um it seems like more of a hodgepodge and um do you have any favorite songs that you love playing for years and years i loved playing don't let start believe it or not um even though we probably we would basically have to play it at every show and still play it um more at more shows than not um because it had because it was a great i mean it was not um it was just kind of by accident it just has a lot of different guitar things in it you know there's like i get to play you know there's like chords and lead lines and you know the little it which part which, you know it's just like it's a really fun which one play. of you sings that one well now and that's the other thing is well now sings it so does he I don't put have it to do and i don't have to do anything but play does he fun. put on uh, a slight accent sometimes or is that like it, the, the boston accent comes out a little bit more sometimes than others uh is that I, intentional i you know john is john is um there are songs that we sing that are in real character voices on records but by and large in the shows i think we pretty much sing with our straight you know about you know what se what feels like our straight voice mm -hmm. um I mean, I think a song like uh, Window on the last record, you know, John's voice is, I think, slowed down and he's kind of singing in this mm -hmm. mannered way. But, uh, I mean, I think Don't Let's Start is probably, a, you know, essentially his straight voice. I mean, singing is not an, is as organic a thing as, as people think it is. I mean, you still have to, you have to make decisions about how you're going to sing. Right. right? Or, or, or if you're not, um, you're, you know, being, um, you know, not being self-aware doesn't mean that you're not still not making decisions about something. What you know? song do you love singing? Uh, love singing? Uh, I really love singing this Pet Name song, which is a new song on Factory Showroom, mm -hmm. um, basically just because it's got a, a pretty big um, range, and uh, I get to sing in really full voice. The last time we saw you in San Francisco, it was you were very athletic on stage. Uh -huh. There was a lot going on. It's a re it was a real show. Uh -huh. Now is that is it the same for this tour? Uh, there's a fair amount of jumping around. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much a it's a pretty physical show. Is that um, partly staged? Do you have people saying, "Look, it's getting boring here. Do something," and then you know at certain points in the concert you know to do something? Wow, you know, I, it, it would be interesting if nobody ever gives us that kind of feedback, even. Ever. Wait till after the show today. Right. right. <laughs> um, it would be interesting if, if uh, I think, you know, we've always, we've always been very audience oriented in terms of how we pace our show. Um, we don't really want it to uh, ever slow, you know, slow down too much. Um, and we've done, we do so many shows that I think um, there's a certain kind of wind tunnel testing that's, that's been going on for a long time that mm -hmm. we know not to do things like put two small slow songs next to each other or stuff right. like that. Um, you know, I'm constantly giving, you know, tedious show business advice to my fellow performers about, <laughs> you know, the you know, what's a, a good way to put on a show and, and what's a bad way. Now we're we're seeing here that we can highlight certain questions oh, okay. if you want to mm -hmm. answer them. So uh, let's go back and answer another question from someone who's listening. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you want control of the mouse? Uh, is sure. it helpful? Um, we'll just pass this right along. Well, what does the highlighting do exactly? He's an old he's an old hand at this. Okay. Um, John uh, told me before we started that he was just or recently at Spin Online. Yeah, and and uh, SonicNet. I've done 
I'm sounding that thing twice now. But those you had to type, you didn't. Yeah, it was talk. different. It's 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 nicer to talk. So, um, ask if they ever get weird letters from fans. I mean, I skipped my high school homecoming last month. I was on homecoming court, and I went to their show in East Lansing. Does that? Oops. Does that make you what? Okay. Um, uh, yes, we get many weird letters from fans, and um, can you remember a recent one? Uh, we know we get lots of. A lot of them are very are very sweet. A lot of them are from, from very young people. Um, you know, asking us to do things like you know come to their school, you know, and play, or like take them to the high school dance or their junior high school dance or whatever. Here's one. We'd like to know what the circumstances were at the Salt Lake City show when TMBG could not play the two encores they had on the set list. Well, I'll tell you what happened. We were playing in the, in, at the show in Salt Lake, and um, I was walking off the stage, and there's these things called genies, which are what lighting rigs are set up on. They're basically just like giant tripods. And normally, when you're doing a, a professionally rigged show, there's big pieces of yellow tape all around them that say stay away because they're, they're um, these three foot long uh, metal rods running along the, the ground that are basically just like five, five or six inches off the ground for a distance of say three feet. And so they'll mark them off so you can't trip over them. And I actually, well, I wasn't the only one. Uh, our bass player fell over one on the other side of the stage and the uh, guitar player and Cub, our opening band, had also previously injured herself on the very same thing because they were completely unmarked and in total darkness. So I hit this thing and fell over and fell on both knees and basically thought, you know, I was I was just like paralyzed in you know in pain. And my first thought was, well, the tour is over, but at least I can go home. <laughs> um, so we didn't get to play because I couldn't really I couldn't even stand. Um, and that, but that it, I'm better now. And that was only like a couple of days ago. So I'm kind of glad because it could have been much worse. I thought I had broken something, but, uh, um, will you be back in Toronto soon? I don't think so. Uh, what do you think is your strongest album? Uh, well, I don't know. I guess I said already our first, this record is pretty good. This record is, I think is more dynamic than our last record. Are both of the John's going to be here? No, John Linnell is eating dinner right now how about some more questions folks well we have more yeah, we have more we have Michael. more questions here uh let's talk a little bit about the internet do you go on and surf around and look at different sites at all um no i i don't um i've been involved in putting together our website at the uh which is at uh www.tmbg.com and um trying to just sort of figure out how that would work best um, but by and large, no, I'm, I do a lot of things with the computer with music programming and stuff like that. But, uh, what kind of computer do you have? I've got a two CI and, um, I've got a duo port portable one. Um, but, uh, I, in general, like, I, I feel like it's sort of like taking up smoking or something, you know, I mean, I, I, I know I'd really like it. And I'd probably be completely hooked on it, but I, I just I feel like the longer I can resist, you know, the I'll, the better person I'll be. And what about your songwriting techniques? Do you use the computer to write the music? Um, do you save all your ideas for the lyrics on a computer? Yeah, um, actually, there's a lot of different ways in which we've used the computer over the years. I mean, basically, we started with a drum, using drum machines very early on. And um, when MIDI and sampling came along, it was really a big part of, uh, you know, our sound. Um, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of personal sampling that we kind of explored on Flood and Apollo 18. And um, I mean, a lot of the songs are almost inspired by the sounds that we were getting. You know, you, you, right. you hear something, you create a sound synthetically that just has this incredible quality to it. Um, I mean, I think like it's actually like um, the song "Snail Shell," the guitar sound that 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 kind of like weird power chord, super—it's like a fifth, um, you know, 
being played on. It was kind of inspired by the like this uh, electric guitar synth patch that comes with this like Roland mid, uh, you know, MIDI module. And um, what's funny about it is it's really over the top. You know, it's like it's got this. You know, it's one of the sounds that's like they put in the the module to impress people in music stores because it's got this, you know, wow, you know, crazy. Uh, you know, it just sounds like Inve Malmsteen, you know, blasting off. So, uh, I I want to get some idea of how you actually produce so much material. It seems like as if the two of you are incredibly prolific. Do you does your day include every single day some writing down of lyrics, some writing of music, or do uh, you go through periods where you do that for two months straight and then you stop? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think um, for for me, um, the the touring, the interruption of touring is probably a good way for me to feel like I don't have to write. Uh, we basically have a hard time writing while we're on the road. And I don't even know if we could, you know, if we were just left at home without any stimuli, if we really would produce any more than we do now. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, we I guess... We've, we've recorded like 120 songs or so and probably have, I don't know. I don't feel like we're that prolific, actually, perfectly honest. Well, what about Dyla's song? Is there really a new song on that every hour? Well, it changes. It changes every hour, and there's a big backlog of songs. Right. And actually, I'm just about to dump a bunch of other new songs on there as soon as I get back home. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's... I, don't, I, I sort of feel uncomfortable making too much of the prolific thing because I feel like it's not really that um, that key. I don't think it necessarily mm -hmm. it doesn't really say that much about the quality of what you do in a way. I mean, I I think it would be you know I would rather write one song that that people found you know really valuable and important to them than write a million songs that are just you know kind of I don't want to get caught up in like this sort of like man songwriting contest. You know, I guess like, I just love the I've idea. A million songs. <laughs> I just I've love the two idea. Million songs. Songs. I, can, I just imagine the two of you sort of like, it, it seems like this really creative life where you get up in the morning and you have this idea and you write a song. And well, it is great. I mean, I, you know, I didn't write songs until I was about like 20 years old. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to be involved in. I, I find it like incredibly exciting. I mean, I don't know. If the, the, best, the best comparison I, I feel like I can make is like, I don't know if you've ever like worked in photography or done anything in the dark room and like and you put the piece of, you know, you expose the photographic paper, then you put it in the developer. There's, and then you go like, it's your photograph. I mean, you took the photograph, you're developing it. It's totally your thing. But there's also this element, this this element of magical, you know, technical. You know, that it when it comes together and you see it just kind of happen, um, it definitely feels like you feel like there's another thing going on besides what you're doing. I mean, I've written a lot of songs, but I still get this kind of crazy excitement from the process of writing it when it actually sounds like a song you know it sounds there's an otherness to it that's hard to uh to i mean uh, it's hard to ever get used to for me do you write a lot of songs while you've got instruments there or do you write them in your head and then mark down musical notes i've written i mean one thing that i think probably has helped us write a lot of songs is that we try to come up with a lot of different strategies to write songs like you know write a song on an instrument that you're not familiar with or write a song. Um, I mean, I've done, you know, over the years, I've tried a lot of different things. I've tried to write songs where none of the words rhyme. I've tried to write songs that only have, like, um, I wrote this song called Moving to the Sun. I was trying to write a song that only had one chord, use one chord and write a song, which is, a, you know, a almost impossible thing to do. And chances are it won't be a good song. But it seemed like an interesting idea. And I was actually, um, I got this, when I put up the Monopuff record, Record Disc was kind enough to send me this, enormous pile of Elvis Costello reissues that they'd put out. And um, I was, you know, going through them and looking at the liner notes and thinking about, you know, I mean, there are all these written liner notes that explain about all these songs that he wrote. And I'm a big Elvis fan. And I saw, like, there was this, you know, one, you know, B-side or some, you know, bonus track that was on there. And he's saying, this is a song I tried to write using one chord. And I was like, oh, God. You know, I'm not the only one. But, uh, you know, it, it's... In a way, you know, it's you're always just trying to find another way, another sort of excuse to write another song. Have, have you ever thought 
of trying to just write a hit and make a lot of money, like write it even for somebody else, because I feel as if you have all the elements to do that and that you've written songs that sound like hits to me, but have you ever thought, hmm, if we had only done that a little differently, we could have been number one? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, we're trying to write songs that will be interesting to people, you know, as interesting as they can possibly be. Um, and I guess, you know, part of it is that there's limits to, you know, how uh, self-conscious you can be when you're actually, do, you know, writing something or just involved in a creative act. I mean, I, I do have kind of a, a respect for people who are like, um, I'm trying to think of that, that lyricist who he wrote like the lyric to like a million billion hit songs um sammy khan who just has like the most like crass you know kind of like we're writing hits baby you know kind of perspective on it and you know but he you know some of his lyrics are like really poignant and kind of and and very uh i mean he's, he's he's not he's not a hack at all but he's he is thinking about how to tap into people, you know, into an audience, how to like speak to an audience or, or how to like, you know, figure out what everybody's thinking about. Or like Chuck Berry is the same way. Like, you, you know, when people ask him, like, why did you write that song about like, you know, cruising along in your automobile? And it's like, well, because, you know, all the teenagers have automobiles. And I, I sincerely think he actually was thinking, well, what do most people want to do? Or what, what are most people into? For me, it's just not that interesting to think about, you know, I don't think about what most people do. I don't. I'm, those things, those ideas, aren't very compelling to me. Um, I mean, I guess I'm just not a populist, or you know, I mean, I, I feel like I'm. I mean, I, I feel like you know, I feel like I, you know, there's a, you know, the band. There's a generosity of spirit about they might be giants that's obvious to a lot of people. But on some level, it is a very personal expression, and I don't think it's appropriate for us to like be thinking about you know, what is on other people's minds. But did you, did you or John ever write a song that you thought after you had recorded it, this will be a hit? No. <laughs> I wish, you know, it would, it would, be, it would be really cool. I, yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, at this juncture in my life, you know, we're doing all the things that people in, with musical careers do anyway. I mean, we do interviews and tour, and, and I mean, basically, it seems like if we had a hit, the only thing that would change is it would make our lives a lot easier. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, we run the risk of alienating people in our audience, but at the same time, I, I feel like, you know, we've done enough work that pe- I would think people would realize that, you know, there is sort of a, you know, some kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's, you can't just declare yourself. You know what I really want to talk to is I really want to talk to Randy Newman, because he's somebody who had this incredible musical career that I completely respect. He wrote these very personal songs that are, you know, insp- very inspiring to me, just as kinds of songs. He wrote these extreme character songs. And, um, and then he had this huge hit that really, in a lot of ways, if you hadn't heard it a million times, would just be like a lot of other Randy Newman songs. I mean, Short People is not that different than a lot of other, you know, it's like, it works on a couple of different levels. You know, it's a song that's essentially about intolerance or racism or, you know, I mean, and then there's this sort of obvious thing that's just kind of light and fun, um, you know. But it obviously changed his career. I mean, uh, you know, maybe he probably just got totally rich and things were really groovy for him afterwards. I remember when I, I was talking to Joni Mitchell about Dog Eat Dog way uh-huh. back, and she told me that she felt all the songs that she had written had the potential to be hits, and she was just... Right. Know, she was just... But she had a lot of hits. I mean, she had a lot of hits that were completely like herself. I mean, you're sort of talking about... You're yeah. saying, like, do you ever think that if you change an element of what you're doing, then you could have a huge hit? Yes. I mean, it's hard enough to even come up with the original thing, let mm-hmm. alone, like, try to figure out how to dismantle it to make it right. safe for mass consumption... Um, you know, I think, you know, we're, we tend to be, you know, we're pretty hooked up into like, you know, I mean, we edit ourselves pretty severely and we critique ourselves, you know, pretty honestly a lot of the time. I mean, we definitely know that some of the stuff we do is stronger than others. So, I mean, but I mean, for Joni Mitchell, it's probably very confusing because she does a lot of songs that are really, a lot of her biggest hits are these really idiosyncratic, crazy songs that are just pure expressions of her musical thing. And, uh, you know, 
uh, I would imagine that that probably is true. She'd probably go, well, why, if, if you know, yellow taxi can be hit, why can't this one be a hit? You know? Right. And she's right, but, you know. But there's another thing, before we go back and see if there are more questions, I'm just curious, again, about the, the things you've seen change since you started your career. Uh, in an odd way, even though the political situation was worse in the 80s, mm -hmm. I felt that the art scene was pretty exciting when you were getting going and you were part of this sort of excitement that things were going to change and something right. new. And I have a sort of creepy feeling about the 90s and I can't put my finger on it. I'm wondering if you have any sort of feeling about the times we're in. Like, what worries you or what excites you right now? Or do you feel good about where the world is at? Or Well, I think, you know, I think it's interesting that... Um... I sometimes wonder if, you know, personally, if, if just rock music as like a form of like uh, kind of subcultural expression is actually over. That's, that's, I mean, it seems like it's in kind of, you know, this mannerist period where, you, you know, you can really easily point to almost any groups, uh, you know, what's at the core of their style and find some predecessor. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's essentially retro. And um, that just seems kind of not good enough to me. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think there should be more original bands. There should be more bands where you go, I don't know what kind of music that is. I don't understand that music. You know, I mean, that's, you know, most of what I hear sounds kind of like strange versions of things that I already knew really well. And I think there's a good chance that maybe it just is you know, on its way to becoming some kind of museum piece. Um, I mean, it would be nice if it was sort of parallel to like jazz right before bebop came along. But, you know, maybe rap, that's what rap is. I mean, maybe rap is really the future of rock um, because it has a lot of the, the elements that, I mean, people are really intolerant of rap's message. You know, people have a really hard time dealing with it in exactly the same way that they had a really hard time dealing with you know, Little Richard or, you know, you know, the Jefferson Airplane or any band that was just like saying like, be a total weirdo and step outside of society and, 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 you know, join us on the other side. I mean, I think that's, you know, I mean, maybe it's not, you know, it's certainly not, um, you know, I'm not like, you know, gonna, you know, start, you know, I, I don't think I will be an original gangster too soon. <laughs> But um, but I think you know in some ways that you know that it, it's hard to ignore the fact that that like most rock music is kind of uh, it's just essentially a known quantity and it seems like it might really be over. The other the other thing that strikes me a lot of times is that uh, you know with the internet as the sort of a fad that's coming up and it obviously is really a big part of like teenagers' lives. It seems like it's just an, another way to get to countercultural things a lot sooner than going to the mall and finding the weirdest record you can find in the mall. Do you? you know, which was for me, like that was my window, you know, like finding like a Captain Beefheart record or a Frank Zappa record at the Burlington Mall in Burlington, Massachusetts. That was like a great, you know, that was a tremendous window on to other kinds of music. And, you know, it, it definitely helped, you know, I mean, I'm, I was, you know, to some extent, I, I don't know, it's, an, it's an interesting question, you know, what people have access to definitely affects the way they approach the culture because there are the more cynical people who would say yes this is the hype that we're told that the internet is going to make counterculture more accessible but in fact it's not really working that way I, it would be the cynical viewpoint yeah I, I think you know it's obviously there's there's more stuff you know I mean people have access to more outlets I mean I guess just as a suburban kid I felt very isolated and um, you know, when I got to go into the city, it was like fascinating. And I feel like in a lot of ways, the Internet provides people with a similar kind of experience. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of I, don't know, I, was, I was listening to NPR and they were having like a discussion with like book retailers. And, and they're talking about how, you know, all these borders and, you know, uh, Barnes and Noble stores sort of opening up with like coffee shops in them. And they're like book clubs and there are all these different kind of kind of how like mall culture is becoming more sophisticated and and they're you know these I guess these it there's sort of a teen aspect to it um this kind of bohem there's like sort of a miniature teen bohemia thing happening in all these mall chain bookstores 
And you know, basically, I was listening to all these like New Yorkers who were just like feel like their whole personal identity is defined by the fact that they moved out of their small town, moved to New York, became a sophisticated person, and you know, told their you know friends and parents, "No, I'm different. I'm an individual. I'm I'm an intellectual." I'm going to make a stand, you know, in this culture. And they basically just can't get over the fact that a lot of people, you know, would be into it if given the opportunity. And, and there is something very elitist about, uh, I mean, it's sort of in the nature of, 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 you know, Bohemia or in the nature of counterculture. There's a, it is an elitist act. If everybody's, you know, if everybody's invited, then how could it be good, you know? So. And how do you answer that question? Uh, get over it. <laughs> We're here. Are there more questions on the screen? That oh, there are many. See? There are many. Okay, um, answer a few. Did Johnny Cash ever recognize or even hear his sample on the Pink album from Mootry? Um, we sampled a Johnny Cash record on our first album, and uh, actually, we the first time we ever met with a lawyer, we had a long list of questions for him because we were just didn't know like about the legality of certain things. And one of them was about clearing this thing with Johnny, the sample of Johnny Cash. And uh, it was like 12th on the list of, you know, 15 questions. And we asked him the sixth question. And our lawyer said, well, that's an interesting question because I was uh, representing Johnny Cash once and we Ooh. sued the pants off this guy and made a ton of money off something. And and uh, we just skipped over the, the 12th question. <laughs> and uh, no, we never talked to him about it. I don't, I don't think he's ever heard it. What was the sample? It's uh, him saying "Mama sang bass." Oh right, sure. It's, Johnny, it's uh, it's like from this this kind of. Uh, I thought it was you really imitating ugly, him. It's from a really bad, sort of bad Johnny Cash song, actually. Yeah, I thought you were doing song. an impression of him. No, no, it's a sample. Uh, it's actually one of our earliest samples. I heard that there will be a new B-side compilation. Is it true? Yes, in February we're coming out with a two-CD set that basically compiles our first album. The album Lincoln, the EP record Miscellaneous T, and then there'll be about um, 15 unreleased songs from around 1985-86 um, that uh, will all be on two big CDs. Be, it'll be like 80 songs on two records, and that'll be out in February. It's called Then, The Earlier Years, and uh, it'll be on Restless. Is there any word about a new video? Well... It turns out that um, SDXXY is, might be becoming a big hit in Australia, and um, we might make a video for the... It's, it's, it's sort of confusing, because we set out on this tour without making a video, and um, we've been working so hard at doing all these live shows. We opened for Hootie and the Blowfish for a month, and uh, that was sort of right at the time that we would normally be kind of prepping for a tour, and um, so we didn't get a chance to do a video, and, but now that um, SCXXY is, is kind of taking off, it seems like we might be doing a video for that or we might be doing a video for Till My Head Falls Off, which is probably the next single, which is also answering another question from Mr. Claw, too. Uh, uh, all these names are unpronounceable. Did you like playing at the... I, I don't even know what this is. Uh, what are your literary guideposts? What authors do you read? Oh, that's an interesting question. Do you have time to read while you're on tour? I read, you know, I I read a lot of biographies and like um, I don't, I don't read that much literature. I, w I feel like I, I wish I did. Um, I I read read this interesting book of poetry by this guy I was telling you about, Hal Sierowitz, um, called Mother Said, and um, you know, I I just I just bought this book about making movies called. Hello, he lied by this by this woman who's a you know a, a movie producer. But um, I I wish I I wish I actually read more literature. But I feel like um, I don't know. I feel like I never have enough time to really like get into it all the way. Biographies. I read this great biography of uh, called Lush Life of Billy Strayhorn, Duke Ellington's collaborator. It was really a fascinating book. Um, Did you ever read that Oscar Wilde biography? It was incredible. No. Yes, no. it's very large, so it might not be easy for carrying around on tour. But uh -huh. you really get into his whole life and yeah. learn a lot about the time. It's funny because you know, I, I mean, people ask us a lot of questions about our work and about ourselves and our relationship, our our person, like our personal relationship to our work. And you know, a lot of times I basically feel like just saying, 
well, you know, it's it's just our work. You know, our personas are not that big a, a part of it. And then, on, but then on the other hand, like I'm really fascinated by people's stories. So I mean, I understand the natural impulse to. Can I ask a few of the biographical sure, questions? Sure, absolutely. Are you still based in Brooklyn? Yeah. Really. Yeah. And yeah. and you're married now, is that right? Yeah, I just got married this summer. Hey, and, me too. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. Uh, it was a big ceremony, small ceremony. It was ceremony. very small in Mill Valley, California, uh -huh. backyard. How about you? Uh, it was in uh, in Brooklyn at the Botanical Gardens. It was quite nice. Oh, great. Relatively small. So when you say small, how many people? Uh, oh, well, it got bigger and bigger. But it was Come about, I think it, I, think it, I think it became 80. Oh, that's, that's, that's still pretty that's small. That's pretty small. Yes. 80 sounds like big to people who haven't gotten married, but 80 well, is actually pretty, really keeping it under control. I know we, we did horrible things because we had a space problem, so we oh. sort of told certain people, like, you can't bring your girlfriend, you can't bring your boyfriend. Wow. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> I know. Afterwards, we felt terrible. Uh -huh. We apologized publicly to all those people. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is hard. I mean, we've had like 150 people, which seemed like more than enough on paper. I mean, like just abstractly, but then when we actually realized that it was meant 25 friends and their, right. you, know, eat, you know, your parents, her parents, and we our friends, it's not that many people. There's a, there's a building in the Botanic Gardens, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a whole setup there. Okay. It's, it's really and cool. is your wife a musician? She is a musician, yes. And, and she's also a writer and is involved in all sorts of different like, creative things. Production. When you hold a wedding, and now that you are famous, do people try to crash the wedding and no. things like that? No, no. You never know in this world. No, thank God they don't. Um, and so let's more see. More questions. Uh, how do you explain your long-lasting popularity through totally different periods, e.g. early and late 90s? Hmm. Well, you know, I think we just have always kind of done the thing that we do. Um, we're, uh, I mean, one of the nice things about being a band that isn't hooked into fashion or trends is that you, you know, even it's kind of like taking the low road. I mean, you basically can hang out for a lot longer. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, you know, part of it is just we, we enjoy what we do. And, and the other part is we've had a great, very loyal audience. I mean, I, I'm constantly amazed at how, um, you know, how much people respond to what we do. Um, I mean, they really are, are very cool about... My, my mind is wandering off in the, mm -hmm. toward the question about what books you read. Uh -huh. Is there something else that... Like, when you have time to do whatever you want, you're on the road, what, what would you do? Do you play video games? Do you watch TV? Is there a TV show you love watching? Do you like going to Star Trek movies? What? Uh, I like going to junk stores. I've, I have a long... I really like... Um, I really like being in the debris of the first half of the century. Um, I, I could find I really, some debris for you. Yeah. No, I mean, send it's, it your it's, way. It's, it's, it's funny. I mean, it, it's, it's not so much that I want to, I don't collect, I don't really collect anything. I, I, I have some, I collect some old magazines. Um, but by and large, I actually really enjoy just being in that setting. I just kind of, you know, sifting through books and old records and things, you know, just things kind of the, the, you know, what's left over. What are the old magazines that you treasure? Oh. Do you I have mean, a particular like, one that you no, love? No, I mean, you know, just like books, like, you know, just magazines that are like about, you know, popular song magazines or, you know, even just like, uh, you know, on a pretty regular basis, I'll just buy a Time magazine from 1932 and I'll like read it at lunch. And it's just a really interesting way to experience history as like a, you know, it's not... It's not somebody telling you what's important. It's just obvious. It's it's just it's it's just really informative. You know, it's, it must it's be an interesting shocking. window on people's points of view from that time. Yeah, the perspective. Are are, are there examples of things that you've read that really shocked you and seemed totally different from the way you saw? It well, in the gender book? roles are certainly more established. Um, you know, I mean, people made a lot of assumptions about what women were good for and what men were good for. Um, I mean, that's like the most, probably the most shocking thing. Um, I mean, because that's really up front. Um, but, you know, I guess, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm really curious about the history of, of this century. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know. Um, well, maybe we should take a few more questions and then we'll, we'll 
wrap up with a few more. Okay, here's the speed round of questions. How did you get those neat necklaces that you had on Conan? Well, they're, well they were made by our graphic designer, Barbara Glauber, who designed the cover of our most recent record and did the monopuff record as well. And they were made by hand, and they are not available anywhere. When will the Larry Sanders show air? It's airing tonight, and um, you should check it out. Uh, I, th I think it's on at like 10 o'clock. In the middle of their show. In the middle of our show, but um, if you're not in San Francisco, it, I, w I would say check out HBO. Um, was the Hootie and Blowfish tour a record company idea or your own? Actually, it was Hootie and the Blowfish's idea. They called us up. They're big fans of the band, and uh, they asked us if we were interested in doing it, and they offered us some dough, and... Uh, it was quite sort of an experiment, you know. Basically, you know, we knew exactly what we were getting into. I mean, I think people are always surprised. They go like, "Well, why, you know, why would you go do that?" But I mean, for us, it was a way to get, you know, we played in Nebraska in front of like twenty thousand people. We're never going to be able to do that otherwise. Um, I mean, I. How was it being an opening act? I always. I don't like being an opening act yeah. ever. I wouldn't, you know. I mean, I, I opened for Elvis Costello last year, and you know, it feels like work. You know, it's like I, if if we weren't doing a real tour, you know, afterwards, I don't think I'd be interested in, in doing it. It's a very unsatisfying thing because you're basically playing for a cold audience and even if you win them over with a song, you're, you're just as likely to lose them on the next one, especially doing the kind of material that we do. But we've had some good, we've had some good experiences um, doing festivals where we're playing for really diverse audiences um, and audiences that, you know, definitely aren't there to see us. So when, it was just a way, you know, I mean, it's just kind of, it was a way to, you know, open up our audience. Were the Hootie people polite? Oh, God, they're so nice. It's, it's crazy. They're like I mean, the, the audience. Uh, there were a couple of shows where people would be like chanting Hootie, Hootie, but, you know, <laughs> um, you know, our audience chants Giants, Giants at our openers. I mean, it's just kind of, you know, there, people have this conception that like the opener is in the way of the headliner a lot of times. They don't realize that schedules are made weeks in advance and shows are run, you know, by in union halls and have this I mean, there's so many more rules about putting on a show than people ever would. But when know. they when they chant hooty hooty, do you go back into the dressing room and throw yourself down on the sofa and sob? I was just happy if we could get off stage before they turned the house house lights on. Actually <laughs> that was the thing that was the most jarring because we'd be like, you know, running across the enormous domes floor in the back, you know, like the the stage is sort of at the one end of like the arena and then there's a, it's in this like sports complex and then there's like a kind of a long w walk to like where the backstage area is. So you're still inside the sort of performance area and every pretty much every other show we wouldn't actually even make it to the door before all the house lights came on. It was just this bright, you know, fluorescently lit room. It just kind of took a lot of the mystique away. Um, but anyway, enough about that. What do you think is the main priority and strength of your group now, the lyrics or the music? Um, well, I think, you know, we, we basically try to do a unified thing. I mean, we really think of it as songwriting. And um, you know, sometimes, sometimes a, a really slight lyric can be supported by a really bold and interesting piece of music. And sometimes, like, a, and know, sometimes nothing will support those slight lyrics. Sometimes nothing will help. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. You know, basically, you know, it, it's a package deal. I mean, that's, that's, that's how it always is for us. Um, where did you come up with the idea for Particle Man? What, if anything, do you mean by it? Well, this, that's a question really for Mr. Linnell, but he's, we get asked that question a lot, and I think people are, the main thing is that people are wondering if it's a metaphor for something else, which I think it's safe to say it is not. It's basically just a character song. It's, you know, it describes a set of relationships between these different characters that are you know, kind of, you know, there's a theater to the song, that I think is kind of interesting. Is is little uh, little birdhouse in your soul? Is that really about a nightlight? Mm -hmm. Just checking. Yeah. Next. Um, we we uh, okay. Um, do people ever call and order the truck in the old flyer from '94? Um, our manager actually uh, collects cars, and uh, we offered one of them up for sale for basically the price that he'd be willing to sell it for. Um, I don't know if he got any offers on it. The idea was that basically it would be like, you know, we sell a lot of T-shirts and things with the name They Might Be Giants on it. And so we would sell you this. It was a Morris Mini Minor pickup truck. It's about the most adorable vehicle you've ever seen. It's like strange because it's tiny, but it's a pickup truck. It's got this tiny little back on it. And uh, 
but it ain't but, cheap. But nobody's nobody's bought it. Well, he he got it for he got it for a song. I think I don't think he, he was too deep into it. Um, well, that's all the questions I've got here. Okay, I've answered it. Well, the the wrap up that I want to do is mm -hmm. just to ask you about uh, the things you have planned for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, are you going to be directing any videos? Um, I probably will direct a video in January. I've got to talk to my rep about it while I'm in Los Angeles. So you can't reveal the name of the band or anything like that? Oh, I don't think they even know that they're making it yet. Oh. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, videos, the whole video business is, is very, is, is basically founded on the idea that it's, you know, it's already late in the day and we've got to get going because we're way behind schedule. I mean, I've, I've worked on a lot of videos and they're almost all there's no planning involved. It's like you get the job and you're working on it. It's like done three weeks later. It's crazy. And is there a, a end plan to this tour or is it just sort of indefinitely continuing? We're um, on the road until Christmas in the United States. Uh, basically, we're, we're going to be playing in, in, you know, all over the United States um, until then. And we're going to be doing... Friday nights in New York City at Irving Plaza in February. We're actually writing new material for those shows. It's kind of like what we did last year, where over the course of the month, we'll be introducing more and more new material. And by the end of the month, we'll be pl probably playing almost an album's worth of new songs, which is a very exciting process for us. Um, then uh, in March, we're going to Australia and Japan and Europe. And in April and May, we're in the United States. Me too. So we have that in common. Yeah. So on that happy note, thank you so much for coming. Well, we really you. appreciate it. All right. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Our next scheduled live audio event on Friday, Lori Anderson continues the Multimedia Pioneers Lecture Series presented by San Francisco State University's Multimedia Studies Program. It's in talk.com, Friday, November 22nd at 8 p.m. Pacific, Saturday at 0400 Greenwich Mean Time. You can find links to audio programs throughout the Hotwired network on the audio files page. That's www.hotwired.com slash audiolab slash radio. Thanks to all who helped on today's show, including GB for the chat, Brian Benitez, the engineer, Michael Small, and our guest, They Might Be Giants. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>